I played the original Destiny for a grand total of 60 days, 6 hours and 24 minutes. I really can't tell you why I did. I think I was depressed at the time. I would do a deal with the devil in a heartbeat to get those two months back, but unfortunately, that's not how real life works. So before you say I'm not qualified to talk about Destiny in a critical light, which people have genuinely told me before. Up in the corner of the screen, there's a nice little X you can press if you can already feel your blood boiling. Go away. At the time of me writing this, I've spent one day, 12 hours and 42 minutes in Destiny 2, which I think is plenty to give the game a fair rap. So many people have asked me what I think of Destiny 2 and I've stayed pretty tight-lipped until now. Let me give you the short version before I get more in depth. My expectations for Destiny 2 were meteorically low and I was still left dissatisfied. I wanted to stop playing on the second planet, the story isn't nearly as good as people are saying it is, but at the same time I think if vanilla Destiny launched in the same state of Destiny 2, no one would have really complained in the same way they did about the original Destiny. Yes, I know, I didn't like it, ha ha ha, I hate everything didn't like something, that's not predictable at all. I suppose you can decide for yourself if you think it's because I'm burnt out on the series or because the game is actually horribly flawed. I'm sure you'll let me know even if I don't want to hear it. Destiny 2 is bigger, louder, more epica, more funnier. Yeah, it's a good job, Colonel. More, more cinematic more repetitive, more destiny uh, than ever before. It's a game designed for two types of people. The first being Destiny fans who will accept anything with the name on it, and the second are people who like first-person shooters, grindy loot-based games, and don't mind general repetitive Ubisoft-style mission design and collectathons. Unfortunately, if you're like me and you find the art style, world design, and science fantasy universe to be the biggest draw, this is not the game for you. Well, unless you also fit into the two groups we just established. At the very least, I was hoping for the story content to live up to the promise of being a rich cinematic campaign. Buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. Just like it says on the back of the box. I guess if by rich they meant vapid, and by cinematic they mean there are cutscenes that show things that kind of look like a movie, then I guess they'd be right on the money. Ha! Yes. Yes. Destiny 2 starts in a weird place. Okay. There is only one character people care about, that being Nathan Fillion's character Cade Six. This is evident by Cade Six being the main focus of the marketing. Meanwhile, basically everything else in the game is completely expendable. There was a time when we were much more powerful. But that was long ago. In fact, a reboot would actually have been much easier to work with in terms of story and narrative, because it is such a hilarious mess. All ends of beginnings. We start the game with a bunch of characters we don't care about in a world we hardly know against enemies we don't really understand. I have so little knowledge about the way Destiny works in terms of lore that I might as well know nothing. And this is coming from someone who has played Destiny for over a thousand hours. Oh yeah, and if you feel compelled to combat some of my points about the narrative with a sentence that begins with any of these following things, in the lore, in the grimoire, on the wiki, I want you to shut up and go away because in my opinion that does not count. Of course there should be a way to expand your knowledge of a universe you want to know more about, but if it's not presented in the game in an obvious way, I do not consider it part of the story that the majority of people will experience. To my utter disbelief, there is still no Mass Effect style codex page in any of the menus of Destiny 2. Some things give you the option to read or scan extra details about them, but it's rare and few and far between the constant <laughs> Say for example I wanted a quick recap of what the Hive enemy type are all about. If there was a codex, I'd happily have a read to refresh my memory. But I guess typing some text and adding a tab in a menu would be too much work. It's not like it's been three years since the first game or anything. I'm going to be spoiling the single player campaign now. You've been warned. When you load up the game, you're greeted with Nolan North's unfiltered ghost voiceover. I never knew you in life. Your first life anyway. You died on a battlefield long before my time. I actually much prefer how he sounds without the ghost sound effects. His voice actually has texture and holds much more motion without the constant bleeps and bloops. They called it The Traveler. And when it arrived, it changed your world forever. It was a golden age. And for centuries, humanity thrived. Until it didn't. Nice to see the god-awful atrocious writing is back in full force. And that's basically the same line I criticised in the last Destiny content called Rise of Iron. I... I didn't even know someone with the Traveler's Gift could die. Until they did. Until it didn't. Until they did. Until it didn't. Until they did. Just 
pitifully bad. An ancient enemy pursued the traveler across the universe. The opening serves as a very basic setup for the world of Destiny that slightly retcons the original game. The traveler had an enemy, a darkness which had hunted it for eons across the black gulfs of space. In the original game, the all-knowing bad guy was simply known as the Darkness, which was personified as Black Sludge that inhabited three Vex robots. And then killed it. Now the Darkness is simply referred to as giant triangles that were an ancient enemy. Thank God the blobs of darkness are triangles now at least. They're gradually evolving into shapes that children can understand. Finding out what the Traveler is and giving more explanation as to how this universe functions is what I was hoping Destiny 2 would do at the very least. But all you get are annoying teases and a Marvel style credit stinger that shows the giant triangles that I remember seeing in some concept art once. I guess we'll be seeing them in Destiny 3. This game doesn't want you to know because they're more interested in showing you the boring bad guy who's coming to kill everyone you don't care about. That's much more important. Battle stations! There's a bombastic cutscene where the tower from the first game that houses Cade 6 and the other people you're supposed to care about is attacked. There's a neat shot of a strange machine enveloping itself over the Traveler. It's suitably menacing and it does the job. Your character is introduced in a cutscene where you're flying back to the tower after doing... something. Doesn't really matter. Your ghost is worried because all communication seems to be down at the tower. What is going on back there? You arrive to everything being in utter chaos. You find out that an elite section of the Cabal called the Red Legion have invaded the tower with the intent of harnessing the power of the Traveler for themselves. They're led by a big goofy looking marshmallow called Ghoul, who we'll discuss in a second. You fight your way through the tower in a fun fan y way and wind up in a spaceship with a shipwright. Guardian, time to kick him where it hurts. Oh hell yeah. Are they finally introducing some kind of dogfighting with our ships? Are our ships gonna do something? Oh baby, this is so cool. This is what I've wanted all along. Finally! Oh hang on, I loaded up the wrong footage from a game I actually like. Okay, th this is what actually happens. Let us know when the shields are down and we'll hit that ship with everything we got. You're tasked with getting the shields down from the inside of the Red Legion command ship so the other Guardians can blow it up or something. You do a whole lot of... and end it by... ing the shield generator and then fleeing the ship. How do we come back from this? You don't. Welcome to a world without light. Guardian, something's wrong. You wake up with your movement inhibited in a scene very reminiscent of Mass Effect 3. I'm not sure if it was intentional or not, but a lot of this game reminds me of Mass Effect 3. The opening with a surprise attack, wandering around ruins, taking Earth back. I don't have any real point to make about this, but I did think it was interesting to note. I forgot to mention that before you wake up from your ridiculously high fall off the ship, which may I add is a bizarre way to set up this scene seeing as it was just established that Guardians can now die for good, and no one could survive a fall from that high. I guess his armor protected him or something. Anyway, you have a vision that shows some vague imagery of the Traveler defeating some triangles with a bird flying around. 
The purpose of this vision is to show your guardian that there is a shard of the Traveller that's crashed on Earth somewhere, and also to continue to sow the seeds for another game or DLC or something. I really, really don't like it when games or movies use itself as a platform to set up future sequels. I'd much rather be left saying that I want more over them constantly telling me that there is going to be more and that I should stick around and be excited. Just shut up and tell me the story of this game before you move into DLC or sequel territory, please. Otherwise, I'm gonna continue to not care. And believe me, I already do not care. You're alive. I thought I lost you. I can heal you, but I can't resurrect you. You wander through the abandoned wastelands of Earth in search for basically anything friendly. Luckily, there's a bird that keeps appearing that points you headed in the right direction. I read comments from people saying there is more story in the first hour of Destiny 2 than there is in the entirety of Destiny, and they aren't wrong. However, it is kind of like comparing which is more edible out of my mouldy stinking toe cheese and a cake freshly baked by Paul Hollywood, but even so. If Bungie are good at anything, it is presentation, be it the user interface, which I have to shout out for being amazing in a world where UIs can be so astonishingly bad that they're basically unusable. The cutscenes, the art direction, the lighting, the music, the sound. Honestly, it's in the upper echelon in terms of quality and polish for the things I just listed. For the first hour or so, I was actually quite interested in where the game was going to go. While your imagination is free to run wild, basically anything is possible. If this level of presentation and direction was consistent throughout the entire game, I probably would have enjoyed the campaign a lot more for what it's worth. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. After fighting a pretty tense section where you you have none of your powers, you wind up being rescued by a new character who wears a poncho. It's not really important that she wears a poncho, but I just felt like I had to mention that. Oh look, somebody left a perfectly good guardian lying around. Things must be worse than I thought. And that's our cue. Time to go, people! Uh, but wait, where, where are you all going? As far away from here as possible. That falcon, it belongs to you? The name's Hawthorne, and this is Lewis. Best pilot we got. What about you? Fit to fly? The first major hurdle for me in terms of the story are the inclusion of these ghoul cutscenes, which is what you're shown next. Every one of them starts with his logo or something. These two red lines. What, do you want me to buy a t-shirt with it on, or...? I've never really seen a game or movie do this before, and it's quite jarring. Instead of pacing scenes that cut between each other with establishing shots, music cues, flowing transitions, or basically any other pacing technique, instead they opt for basically grinding everything down to a halt, to shout, This is a scene with the bad guy now! What's wrong with an establishing shot? Every other part of this game is a hard-on for long establishing shots, so... Is it because you don't know where this scene actually takes place so you can't show us? Every single cutscene ends with a fade to black anyway. What would have been wrong with fading in from black to an establishing shot of a spaceship alongside a musical cue for the bad guy or something? Do they think we'd be confused by who this guy is? Well, you think I'm a dummy? We're introduced to Gaul's right-hand man who's simply called the Council, and they talk in a way that no two beings who have known each other for a long time ever would. You know, like calling each other old friend, or simply monologuing in such a way that conveniently catches everyone up on who the hell these freaks are. Basically, they want to harness the Traveler's power for themselves to become invincible like the Guardians. But first, they need to finish construction on the machine that's around the Traveler. Also, they've captured the Speaker. You know that bloke who does nothing but whisper exposition? Yeah, that guy we all care about a lot. This victory is as much yours as mine, old friend. All that remains is the completion of the cage around this great machine. There are a number of things I don't like about this scene. Probably the biggest aspect that might not bother you personally is simply how these characters look. It's distracting. They look like naked mole rats in power armor. They look ridiculous. I always thought the Cabal were the least interesting and frustrating, both visually and gameplay-wise, out of the four enemy variants in the original game. In the concept art, they kind of give off this Jawa combined with a Tusken Raider on steroids vibe, which I guess is kind of cool, but in practice, they just look like goofy pig rats with ludicrous chunky armor on. Visually, they are very hard to take seriously in a world that takes itself so seriously. Now make them speak English out of nowhere and monologue about how powerful and unstoppable they are. Victory as will all things is yours to claim. 
Do you understand why I find this weird and hard to get into? In the Taken King expansion, I thought Oryx did exactly what he needed to. He looked like an intimidating devil bug creature and you wanted to kill him simply because he was evil and looked gross. Look at some of the previous big bad guys from Destiny and its various DLCs. Ghoul, along with his stupid name, is easily the least intimidating and goofy out of the lot. But he's supposed to be the biggest threat you've ever faced. Sure, what he's done at the beginning is the most eventful thing any of these villains has ever done in the universe that we've seen, but this guy should be scary. We should feel like he would be a challenge to take down instead of looking like a big marshmallow mole rat. I find the characters in Destiny so boring and dull already that complex villains with fleshed out motivations and backstories are the least of my worries about this universe at the moment. Every character in Destiny is written one of two ways, these two ways being either funny or boring. I haven't got to it yet, but this game is obsessed with trying to make you understand why Ghoul is evil. But why? What's the point? Why spend precious time developing a pointless moustache twirling villain who's going to be dead by the end of the game, when there are countless other people who are in desperate need of characterization? In my opinion, the Cabal would work much better as a mindless, war-hungry, power-obsessed race of creatures who want to destroy the Traveller, not take it. I remember these guys being established as the dudes who take whatever they want and literally blow up planets once they're finished with them. Here's what I have on the Cabal. 800 pounds and highly militarized. They blow up planets and moons just for getting in their way. Just so you know what we're dealing with. Like that's a pretty bullish and idiotic thing to do, right? They're not exactly the brightest race of creatures, are they? I know Destiny is obsessed with the Traveler seeming important, but it makes more sense to me that the Cabal would see it more of a threat than a weapon to be wielded, and through a childish, warmongering way they would just prefer to blow it up out of the sky. Does this guy really strike you as the type who asks questions, figures out the science behind something, interrogates people for information first, and shoots later? The answer is no. These guys are at such odds with themselves. I could see the Fallen doing this kind of thing way before the Cabal, honestly. They strike me as being way more sneaky and cunning like that. In this cutscene, they allude that the Traveler is referred to as something more accurate than just the Traveler by other species of aliens or something. They call it the Traveler. I would contend that other civilizations may be more precise in their naming. It's really frustrating when you want to know answers to things you find genuinely interesting, but you never get them. I do not care about Ghoul's history. I care about something more important to this world. At the end of Destiny 2, basically nothing seems different to how it begins. You beat the bad guy. Woo? It's not like we haven't beaten a big bad guy who's posed a threat before. It's literally the only thing we've done for years. Why has it been a total of three years playing this damn series and I still have no clue what the Traveler even is? You can't keep such an important element of your story so damn vague. The reason the Force works in Star Wars is because they don't visualize it into a big floating ball that gives everyone their power. If Obi-Wan turned to Luke and was like, Luke, it's the ball that gives us the Force. That ball is so epic, it's everything. Don't you think the first thing Luke would ask would be, what the hell is that ball? Why is it there? The fact that the characters in this world do not question what this thing even is makes them way less relatable to me. If Guardians just got their power from being good or something, then I wouldn't care because at that point it doesn't matter. But if the Traveller is in every bit of marketing and nearly every line of dialogue, you seriously cannot expect me to just be okay with such an important part of the universe remaining unexplained. It's not like this universe has anything else going for it. I do not care about any of the characters because they failed so miserably at establishing them. So the only thing that could interest me at this point is developing the universe. They've built it up to such a ridiculous degree at this point that whatever the Traveller is revealed as being is going to be disappointing no matter what. And that's if they ever even do reveal it. My bet is for it either being an ancient spaceship or piece of technology, or it is revealed to be alive or something. Then they can have that really dreadful line, what? It's alive? That's the kind of level Destiny's storytelling is at, so I wouldn't be surprised. Back with your character, you fly to an abandoned old farm that's conveniently quite close to the Traveller Shard you saw in your vision. You journey to the Shard and get your powers back from it because a game has to happen at some point. Hold on to your helmet. Do you feel it? The light is back. We're back. Eyes out, Guardian. So now all the tension they created by taking the light away is completely evaporated because you're now unkillable again. I guess everyone else can still die, but who cares? 
you're gonna be fine. I don't know why they didn't put some kind of limit on this power to not deflate all the tension, such as the odd line of dialogue from the ghost saying that it drains a lot of energy from him to bring you back to life over and over again, and that you should be more careful as to not waste the light or something like that. At least then I'd feel a little more worried about running into an area and dying instantly. <laughs> Now you're set loose in the first large map called the EDZ. This is when the narrative takes a complete nosedive because there's basically none anymore. This is where the premise of a light MMO loot based open world horribly conflicts with the story. I know a lot of people don't even care about this kind of thing, but alongside there being hundreds of other chosen one guardians breaking how integral you feel to the story, I can understand that if you just enjoy the gameplay, this really won't bother you. But just imagine if you were playing Skyrim and there were a million other Dragonborns running around. It would sure make you feel a hell of a lot less important. At first I felt a little overwhelmed by the amount of new stuff they're throwing at you, but once you figure it out there's actually much less to it. You have side missions called Adventures. They're basically what the main missions from Vanilla Destiny were like. Except a little bit better, but not by, you know, very much. I played all of them, and there was only one that I thought was even remotely interesting because it involved you doing something other than shooting. You also have what are known as Lost Sectors, which are caves with enemies you kill for a reward that respawn after a certain amount of time. And also chests to collect and find that also have loot. Nothing too crazy. For the first few hours of the game, I insisted on exploring every nook and cranny, expecting that Bungie would have included something new to find, or at the very least, some cool environmental storytelling. But after a while, I just gave up because the map's are basically empty. It's weird because every map feels like you're running through a movie set, something designed to trick you into thinking it's a living, breathing world, when you're actually just Truman Burbank. What an immense waste of talent. The art direction and visual design of how the environments look is so flawless that it blows my mind that they did absolutely nothing with them that forces you to actually interact and explore with it in a way that forces you to appreciate the work they put in. This game would much prefer you to just run through as fast as you can and shoot at the boring, mindless enemies and do something like that. You do an uninspired mission where you help Hawthorne get communication online so you can receive messages, and you pick one up from command Commander Zavala, who is all the way on another planet. We rally on Titan. Be brave. You abandon Hawthorne because you think the Vanguard leaders are integral to taking back the tower, and she gets annoyed. There's another awful ghoul cutscene where he interrogates the speaker. Two masked characters who cannot emote because they're wearing masks have what's supposed to be a tense interaction, but it falls completely flat. The light lives in all places, in all things. You can block it, even try to trap it, but the light will find its way. I really like Bill Nye normally, but his delivery is so intrinsically bizarre that it really pulls you out of it. I mean, he's trying his best, but it's so uninteresting. He has nothing to work with. The dialogue is so incredibly awful, we're talking next level bad, that it seems like they learned nothing from the first game. They even have that mind-blowingly atrocious line. We are not so different. You're traveler and I. The animators really struggle to dramatize anything Ghoul does because of his hyper-constrictive design, meaning that they have to settle for hilariously overblown hand and arm gestures, and the odd exaggerated movement of his disgusting naked mole rat eyebrows. Every shot is dull and uninspired, mostly shot reverse shot with close-ups of the two boring characters' stupid masked faces. Who thought this was a good idea? The scene has no point other than to elaborate on the fact that Ghoul is desperate to figure out how to take the light from the Traveler and use it for himself. Once you arrive at... Camino, you're informed that you're too late because the Hive have already infested the planet. It's too late. The Hive have overrun Titan. I was wrong to bring us here. Halfway through the second mission of this planet, I was bored to tears to the point of nearly abandoning this entire video. I did not want to play it. I had had enough. I knew it was not going to get any better than this. At the end of the last Destiny video, I said I had hope because I'd theorised that the reason all the extra content they added was so terrible and stingy was because they've been using the majority of their time and resources developing something really impressive for the sequel. I have no idea what they've been doing for three years because this game is fundamentally identical to Destiny 1. The only things that have changed is that they've marginally improved the cinematic design for the campaign, improved the graphics a little bit, and tweaked the enemies and super abilities with a couple of new bells and whistles. Apart from the environments, there's nothing particularly new, and even then I noticed a myriad of areas they straight up reused assets from the previous game, and its expansions. I'm convinced that the EDZ, or the farm, is unused assets from Destiny 1. You can even see a place in one of their first teaser trailers, 
that looks just like it. There are two new weapon types, a grenade launcher and a submachine gun. You have an elaborate science fantasy world with crazy magic, spaceships, aliens, and all sort of insane design. But the only new way you have to interact with it is a grenade launcher and a submachine gun. This is putting me to sleep just having to describe it. Okay, so the guns and everything are basically the exact same. What about what you're shooting at? Well, all five of the enemy types from Destiny 1 and the Taken King come back, and they're all completely identical, aside from some tweaks so minor I doubt any casual player would even notice them. The only new creature you have to fight is a four-legged cabal dog thing. That's unique. I wouldn't particularly mind this too much if the AI for these different enemies required more dynamic ways of taking them out, or if these worlds were filled with crazy dangerous wildlife or something, but they all follow the exact same formula. The game encourages you to hide behind cover, look down your sights, aim your reticule up with an enemy's head, and pull the trigger. You do this until everything is dead, and then you run along, and then you repeat until the game is over. Destiny 2 asks so little from you that it might as well play itself. Every encounter feels the exact same every enemy feels the same. If you get too close to them, they push you away with an AoE attack. If you damage them too much, they run away and hide. They all do one of these two things. A lot of the enemies specialize in flinging you around the map to keep you away from them, but luckily you can basically fly, but most of the time it's still incredibly aggravating. Sometimes they try to break up the monotony of the constant shooting with platforming puzzles, but seeing as you can fly, there is no challenge to it and it's basically a way of cheating in how they can design the maps so as to not need to be tailored to a specific type of movement. Okay, so if all the guns are boring, the environments are all like two-dimensional movie sets, all the enemies are dull and reused from the first game and all require the same technique to kill, how else do they mix up gameplay? Well, you have super abilities that depend on what class you are, but they're either identical to the last game or slightly tweaked versions of the last game's ones. I guess now you have an extra ability at your disposal. I played as a titan who can now make a piece of cover you can hide behind to reinforce the hide behind cover and shoot everything in their weak spot gameplay loop. It can even reload your gun for you. You basically hardly have to do anything. Now if only I could unlock an ability that plays the game for me, then I'd be set. Okay, so at the very least you can choose between three different character classes. That's like a decision you can make. That sounds fun and interesting, right? The best part of Borderlands is playing around with the different classes with all their mad skill trees and super abilities that all feel really different. Well, in Destiny 2, the same three classes are back from the first game and all the supers are the same. They have a skill tree now that you use skill points to unlock abilities, but it feels like they put it in there just because that's what games with loot are supposed to have. A skill tree. It hardly changes anything, really. The differences between a Titan, Warlock, and Hunter are minimal at best. They all feel the exact same to control despite a few minor differences like your jump. But again, this is no different to how it works in Destiny 1. It's not something fun like, let's say, the Titan is a tank who specializes in melee weaponry or punching at close range, while the Hunter is twice as fast and runs around scouting or sniping while the Warlock is buffing them or casting spells. It's the illusion of choice. Fundamentally, you are all the same no matter what you choose. Okay, so if the gameplay is boring, your character class is boring, the story is boring, the environments are boring, the enemies are boring, I guess the only thing left is the RNG loot that makes the game so addictive for people. Hey, I guess at the very least you can use whatever gun you like the most, right? Well, not really. The way you level up and get stronger in Destiny 2 is attributed to your gear power number, so you're forced to use weapons you hate that have a higher number if you want to stand a chance at leveling up. Forget holding onto that gun that you really like using, or armor that you thought looked really cool, because it doesn't matter if the power isn't high. Instead of chasing fun loot that is enjoyable to customize or use, you chase a number. So you're forced to use weapons you hate that have a higher number if you want to stand a chance at leveling up. For some reason, as well as this power leveling system, there's also an XP leveling system which caps off at level 20. Everyone who plays the game enough will be at level 20 within a few hours, so it's completely meaningless. Whenever you see other guardians running around, 99% of the time there'll be a 20 above their head, as if it's supposed to mean something, or display some kind of valuable information. Why doesn't it just show the power level? You know, the thing everyone is chasing and comparing constantly. Again, I guess they feel like they need to have experience points because that's just a thing that games have. Also, it worked out for them quite nicely because once you pass level 20, you can still fill an experience bar up which, when it's full, grants you what's called a bright engram, which is full of loot, to customize your character. And because this game was released in 2017, you also have the option to buy these bright engrams for real money. I mentioned years ago when microtransactions were first cropping up in Destiny, that they need to be careful to not completely ruin the hook of the game. And in my opinion, they have with this. Not only is it insulting to me that they've put to ransom a bunch of content to encourage you and play mind games with you to spend extra money in a game that already costs $60, but it makes the idea of loot completely meaningless when the story behind you getting it was just, oh, I bought it 
for real money. The stuff they're charging money for is the kind of thing games used to include as actual content. And don't even try to tell me that it doesn't affect gameplay. It's part of the game, so it's affecting my gameplay. That's the end of it. One of the major reward systems in the game can be broken by throwing money at it. That's completely unacceptable. The games industry has done a brilliant job at gradually pushing me away from it with a sickening lack of respect for its audience. I've watched over the last decade how game series I used to adore have been shredded apart for the sake of loot boxes and microtransactions, and Destiny 2 is no different. So all of that is literally every major aspect of the game, and I enjoy none of it for the reasons I just stated. I know this was a ridiculously huge tangent from the story, but I hadn't even touched on the gameplay you've been seeing constantly in the background yet. And seeing as it's the meat of the game, I had to at least acknowledge as to why I was so insanely bored and wanted to quit at this time. Everyone says the gameplay of this game is great, and I guess on a really meaningless level, it does feel pretty good to pull the trigger and feel your gun shoot. But you know, every game does that. But it asks so little of you that I don't even think it's impressive on its own anymore. Especially when there are so many other games in the same genre that are so many leagues above Destiny 2. This game categorically does no aspect of the actual game design better than its competition. But please just let me remind you that I don't think there's a problem with liking this game. These are just my personal reasons as to why I do not like it. Now that that's out of the way, maybe you'll understand how I feel a bit more. So we can continue on with the story. Back on Kamino, they establish a new character who's just as boring as the others, who only exists to hand tokens into. You do a whole lot of busy work for people and wind up with Zavala again. It's yet another one-sided flat cutscene where you're talked to. The only thing your character ever does in any cutscene in Destiny is stand there in silence and listen to people natter on at you. It is not interesting. I am so sick of it. Without the light, are we even guardians anymore? Commander. What is the point of a silent protagonist if your sidekick just says exactly what your character would anyway? I would much prefer my character actually have a personality over them doing nothing and saying nothing. Why is the focus of the game not you having banter with your ghost, instead of the story cucking you and doing it with someone else right in front of you? Silent protagonists don't bother some people, but for me I don't think it's the right fit for this game. Zavala sends you on a mission to restore power through a generator, which of course means you have to do a mission which involves killing a lot of hive and doing a whole lot of... They mix the gameplay up by putting you in a heavy machine and telling you to drive in a straight line. Then the mission ends. It was pretty much invincible. What, what was even the point of that? As if Destiny needed any other Star Wars comparisons, out of nowhere they reveal that Ghoul has a Death Star that can destroy suns. It even looks like a Trade Federation landing ship from the Phantom Menace, but on its side. I guess the machine that's trapped the light from the Traveler is not threatening enough. They also need a Death Star that is threatening to destroy the sun. Okay. Zavala tells you to find Cade 6 and Ikora Ray because he needs his fire team so he can efficiently grind public events so he can be strong enough to do the raid. Just joking, that's not why he wants him. He wants him so he can take the tower back. How long before the fleet's combat ready? Zavala, wait. So that's what you go and do. You go after Cade first, who's on a planet that looks just like the Black Garden from the first game. Just help me place these beacons and I'll explain. You find out he's got himself stuck in a teleportation sequence and needs help. Quick! Hurry, come on. I don't know how long this portal's gonna stick. Kate? What have you- Stop, 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 stop. Look, look. Long story, and it may look like I don't know what I'm doing, but I do. Okay, maybe not. It doesn't matter. Killing the power source at the origin point should break the loop and get me out of the portal system. Have you got that? Say you've got it. See something! Fine, I'll say it. We got it, Kate. Now how did you- Oh my cotton socks! Did you not hear what I just said? I'm guessing this is why they don't like him leaving the tower. <laughs> you get help from a quirky AI called Failsafe. Should you return, I will be happy to assist you in researching the Vex. We could steal their stuff. That was a joke. Stealing is wrong. Usually. But the Vex are alien robot monsters. Standard moral parameters do not apply. It's not murder if it's robots. Please come visit me again. Everyone I've ever known is dead and their bones are dust. I am very lonely. So alongside Cade, this section of the game is filled with so much comedy, you'd think you're playing Borderlands. It's so strange because the tone of the game hardly has space enough for Cade's goofiness, let alone another comedic relief character. You do some more busy work and bring Cade a Vex teleporter. He makes a whole lot of jokes, some of which work, some of which really don't. The Cabal are bad guys who do bad things. Yes, I get it. What, may we ask, were you going to do with a Vex teleporter? Get up close and personal, go! Put a bullet in his head, then maybe eat a sandwich. And he cares more that Zavala said he needs him than that the sun is going to be blown up. 
Okay. Zavala said he needs me. I think it's a shame that Cade 6 is stuck with his weird robot design. Surely Zavala should be a robot over this guy? Maybe it's to play on the irony that the only interesting characters in Destiny are the machines or something? But that's far too complex an idea for this game, so it's probably incidental. The trend of your character standing there doing nothing with lots of short reverse shot continues. Did George Lucas strike this or something? Cade 6 conveniently knows where Ikora Ray is hiding because there's still one more planet to visit. Zavala lost her after the city fell. We don't know where she is. Io. Io, it's, it's where she'd go to look for answers. So that's what you do. You immediately find her and she monologues at you that this planet is the last place the Traveler touched, so Ghoul is trying to find any secrets to help him with his stupid task. The last place the Traveler touched. I came for answers. I stand here, still, with nothing. Ikora. Zavala is forming a resistance, and he believes- What good is a resistance when you are the only one who would survive? Amazingly, I found her character to be the most interesting out of the three Vanguard leaders in terms of how she dealt with being made mortal again. They don't fully embrace or explore it, but I like how she seems genuinely quite scared to die after being immortal for so long. A neat concept which is much more interesting to think about than it is presented in the game. And I believe they will continue to desecrate all we hold sacred. Save this place, Guardian. Do not squander this second chance. She asks you to save this place, so you guessed it. That's what you do. There's another ghoul cutscene. He's sat down now because his legs hurt from being in this room and standing up for so long. Ghoul monologues his entire past to the speaker for no reason at all, as if we're supposed to care and relate to him. It's clumsy and pointless. Ghoul and his mate have a disagreement over how they want to get the Traveler's power, so he leaves in a huff like a baby. But it is the way. The only way. Not for me. There's another cutscene that doesn't have you in it, where Cade is random with a chicken. Chickens are random, you know. Basically, we need to steal a Cabal ship so we can stop the Death Star while everyone else takes back the city, and finally use the Vex teleporter to get into Ghoul's ship and then kill him. There's a tank mission, which is a nice mix-up. It's basically the same as the last one, except you can shoot this time. Then after you kill a whole lot more dudes, you finally wind up on the Death Star. This mission is significantly better than basically everything before it because they actually use the environment to force you to do more than stand still and shoot. It ends with you disabling the Death Star so the others can start their attack, which is shown in a glossy cutscene depicting an event I'd much rather be playing than watching. There's one final ghoul cutscene which is just bizarre. Ghoul gets angry at the council because he wants to earn the Traveler's light fairly instead of just taking it. Look at your Traveler, Dominus. The cage is complete. The time is now. Claim what is rightfully yours and take this power. Speaker, what more does the Traveler want of me? But I thought it was the ghosts who chose where the light goes, right? There's literally a line of dialogue in Destiny 1 that goes, In its dying breath, the Traveler created the ghosts to seek out those who can wield its light as a weapon. Guardians, to protect us and do what the Traveler itself no longer can. So what, can the Traveler decide now? Is it healed? And then at the beginning of the Taken King, they literally say that the Traveler is dead. I was born the moment the Traveler died. Has that part of the universe been retconned too? It's kind of a gigantic plot hole when the entire motivation of your main villain that you've spent so much time with doesn't even make any sense in this universe. See, this wouldn't be a problem if Ghoul just wanted to blow it up. Just saying. I only ask questions when you make me ask questions. And if these questions were those that you didn't intend me to ask, then that's just bad, confusing writing. The council kills the speaker off screen. I think? No! It's really poorly choreographed and is super unclear. Then Ghoul kills the council. Great. So that's the payoff for all of these expensive cutscenes. He just decides to take the light anyway. I will. 
so all of this was completely pointless and could have been achieved in 30 seconds. We learnt nothing except for the backstory of Gaul, which I personally do not care about. I would have been much happier to just read it in a codex. If you really wanted Bill Nye's character dead so badly, why not just say he died in the attack at the beginning? I doubt anyone would care. About 12 minutes of the 50 odd minutes of cutscenes is completely wasted on these scenes. You return to Earth to join the fight and battle your way through more waves of bad guys. You make your way to the Vanguard leaders who have the Vex teleporter set up and you warp yourself onto Gaul's command ship. I am Gaul! And I have become legend. Then you kill him. Once you beat him, light bursts out of his body and he turns into a big goo monster. Then for the first time in the series, the Traveller does something. Kind of explodes white light everywhere and kills him. Why didn't you just leave with that? Could have saved everyone a whole lot of time. So that's it, that's the story of Destiny 2. That's what everyone is raving about. Have you ever experienced a story before? I have to say that the first time I finished it, I thought it was fine. But it's one of those things that gets worse the more you think about it and analyse it. Like the very final cutscene has the dreadful quote of the speaker going on about the light as if he's Yoda talking about the Force. The light lives in all places. In all things. You can block it even try to trap it but the light will find its way who thought this sounded good it doesn't sound good it sounds ludicrous destiny has always had such a confidence and almost cockiness in the way it tells its stories no matter how awful they are with enough conviction you can make even the most flowery pointless meaningless dialogue sound weighty and important i don't even have time to explain why i don't have time to explain it's basically all they ever do they say a whole lot of words but none of it really means anything i've been comparing this game a lot to star wars because it's very obvious they're heavily inspired by it the problem is they don't seem to understand what makes star wars good. Star Wars deals with incredibly simplistic themes of good versus evil, but when it's at its best it explores the grey area in between, all meanwhile establishing lovable characters who we genuinely care about because they seem like real people, and robots, and fluffy bear things. Destiny has the same hyper-simplistic baby themes of Star Wars, but adds nothing to the mix. There aren't any good characters we care about, they don't explore what being good or evil actually means, and they don't examine the grey area in between being bad and good. The story has nothing to say about anything. It's serviceable action schlock that gives you the bare amount of motivation to propel the player forward. It reminds me a lot of one of those lesser Marvel movies, where the plot is just junk, the villain is boring and forgettable, and the characters are dull. But there were just enough laughs and it was lighthearted to the point where it gets such a new insignificant reaction from me that I forget about it the moment I stop watching it. The mystery and intrigue that is interesting is never expanded upon. Everyone is the same at the end as they are at the beginning. Cade 6 is still a funny book boy, Zavala is still stoic and boring, and the other one is just the same. It's just nothing. If you can sit here and tell me that this is a great story without a single caveat, then you must not have been listening to anything I've said. It has its moments, I guess, especially if you really love Cade 6. But I 100% guarantee that the reason you think this game feels more weighty and impactful than it is, is because Michael Salvatore is such an incredibly skilled composer. The music does all the work. I wish he was working in film because more movies need to score this good. There goes nothing! If Destiny 2 is comparable to a Star Wars film, it would be one of the prequels. The flat direction, combined with the music doing all the work, is strangely reminiscent of how I feel about those movies. I think if Destiny 2 was a more traditional game without all the unnecessary forced-in MMO nonsense, it could be made much, much better. In my opinion, I think the game would be much stronger if they focused on creating a fun, semi-open-world co-op game for just a couple of players. 
instead of having competitive multiplayer and instances where other players are running around the map. It contradicts the story so hard that it completely diffuses what little tension there was to begin with. My friend is even convinced that the only reason for the always online mechanics is so Activision has more control over piracy, which I'd never thought about before. It makes sense. At least if it was a more traditional loot-based open world game, then they could get way more creative and wacky with the world, when they don't have to restrict design to having to work in PvE and PvP. It is so unbelievably dull in its current state. I know what I just said will never happen because they seem to be happy with what the game is now, unlike Destiny 1 which had no idea what it is. At the very least Destiny 2 does know what it is. But I'll be long gone from the equation for the next one so I really don't care anymore. After you finish the campaign is when the grind begins, or continues. You have various side quests, strikes, multiplayer, public events and more, with the main goal being to level up high enough to do the raid. I was really struggling to get to a high enough level because I refused to grind public events, like everyone told me to do, because it was boring me to the point where I wanted to eject the disc and stamp it into pieces. I feel like a drug addict who's managed to kick the habit, who's watching all these poor souls chase the same dragon I used to. That is what Destiny 2 is, chasing the dragon, the game. None of the side quests are very interesting, the strikes are all bad, I cannot believe they still use the exact same design principle of having the boss at the end be a giant version of a regular enemy. They have been doing this for three years with the same enemies. Let that sink in for a second. Public events are kinda cool the first time you do them, but the novelty wears off extremely quickly. They finally added a map for when you're exploring, which is useful, but for some reason you can't see where any of your fire team are on the map, which is just bizarre. And when you're looking for the collectibles, the map takes about two seconds to load. So within about five minutes, I just gave up because it was just too infuriating. Finally is competitive multiplayer. I always thought the Crucible was atrocious in the previous games. And admittedly, it does seem better in this game because it's slightly less of a mess and has been slowed down considerably so you can actually tell what's going on. It's not to say I had much fun with it. I think it's fine. It's a serviceable multiplayer. Is it worth ruining the rest of the game for? Hell. No. But there are plenty of people who like it and I can see why. It's just not why I'd ever play a game like this. And finally we have The Raid, which I have to admit I didn't play. To be fair, it was released a week after so it's basically DLC. I know that might be blasphemy for some of you to hear, but after everything I just said, can you really blame me for not being at all interested in grinding for hours on end just to be ready to play it? I realise that a lot of people love the grind, but I've done it three times before and I simply refuse to do it again. I hardly doubt a mode that has such a high barrier to entry would change any thought I had about the game. After spending weeks playing this game, researching it, writing about it, recording it, editing this video, I sacrificed what could have been two or three regular videos I upload for the sake of covering just this game. I think I've made it clear where I stand in this video and why I do. If it really bugs you that I didn't play the raid, then just go away. This video clearly isn't for you, and you have not been listening to what I've been saying. I may have come across as overly negative so far in this video, and that's because I am utterly defeated by this franchise. Go back to the first video I made on Destiny, and with each new video about this series, I get less and less forgiving. Ironically, because I gave Bungie such a huge benefit of the doubt from the beginning, I have been hurt the most by being an early adopter. People who are enjoying this game the most seem to be people who didn't endure the crap from Destiny 1 for the last three years. They would have just played a couple of hours from the first game and then bounced. I stuck around because, much like the characters in the game, I had hope. Bungie was my traveller. I trusted them without knowing anything about them, who they are or what they want. And then they screwed me in the end and made me look like a dumb idiot. They couldn't even give me moth people. Not one. This planet would have been perfect for it too. They'd look amazing flying around like the elegant beasts they are. You know, if there's giant triangles they show in the Marvel Stinger section, how's moth people, I might just have to see that just for the meme. At least then it will be revealed that the entire state of this universe is thanks to the moth people. That'd be pretty amazing. I think I've said in every one of these videos that I was desperate to care about this universe because I can see the potential, but I don't care anymore. You can't keep giving things credit based on potential. If that were the case, then everything ever could get a pass. This game feels like an HD remake of Destiny 1. I criticised the first game for being all middle without a beginning or end. And this game is all beginning and end with no middle. Everything about it is the pinnacle of style over substance. And once you see through it, you'll never be able to see it the same way again. I do not care about Destiny 2. I will not be playing any more Destiny 2 after this video goes up. I will not be covering anything to do with Destiny anymore. I have said my piece on the matter. I am done. Bow, 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 bow,